Hi, I'm Brian and you're watching Someplace or Another. And today I'm in Wisconsin. So what do you do when you're in Wisconsin? Well, you go to the Cheese Museum, of course. Hey, my little buddy over here too. Let's go check this place out. So what's up, buddy? Oh. Yep. Oh, they're open? Oh. Is that yes or no? Oh. Okay. I'm gonna give you guys a yes. All right, I guess I'm welcome. This is my first stop of the day. The National Historic Cheese Making Center. Well, and check this out. It appears to be an old train depot. That's pretty cool. Well, that's a nice looking caboose. <laughs> uh, i never seen that style of caboose. That's interesting. All right, enough of this lollygagging. Let's go inside. <laughs> I guess we'll see the art of cheese making. Uh, for a bunch when they made cheese, they weren't fitting in that. That's the angle, but sure. Sometimes kids stand in there and they take their pictures. And... <laughs> People ask, well, why did they use copper? Well, that conducts heat evenly for one thing. And also, um, there was thought that when milk is heated up in these copper kettles, something about the copper molecules in the milk built in the 1890s uh, by a family from Switzerland, the Amobersteaks. And they made cheese there, Swiss cheese, and a little bit of uh, bricks or Lindbergh or some kind as well. This is on a farm. And this is how farmers would have brought milk to this little cheese factory. They used 30 gallon milk cans. And that would have been too heavy for a person to lift because a gallon of milk weighs about eight pounds. That little door, notice how it's rounded at the bottom to accommodate the shape of the can. And that would be poured into tank inside the uh, cheese factory and it would be weighed. 1890s technology, they would use that pulley system to, to lift that heavy milk can and it would be poured in here and after 1890 they started using a butter fat test called the Babcock test and they could test for the amount of butter fat in there because farmers would get paid extra if they had richer, richer creamier milk because it was worth more. Now, this is the actual kettle that was used over 100 years ago, used until 1917, and then since about 2010, once a year until the last couple of years, we have master cheesemakers come in here and actually demonstrate the whole process, start to finish, as it was done over 100 years ago. We, it's done just as it would have been done 100 years ago, except in our train station, you'll see how, it's, how it was done in a more modern way but we take turns stirring that. And so that, you know, the farmer didn't need aerobic exercise because, I mean, the cheese maker, because he was having to stir that. Start to finish, it would take a good three hours. And then you'll see the actual process in our video. They would swing this kettle out and have like a big bag of curds. You'll see that on the video. And then they would take it over to the press table and it would be dripping whey. Whey is the byproduct of making cheese and put in the hoop and that's the actual uh, equipment that was used. Look at the press beam that was used. The gentleman in the middle, he is the son of the original owners of this little cheese factory. And when he was about 90 years old, he donated it and was here. Oh, that's cool. So and Stephen Babcock was a, a professor at UW for many, many years. Okay. And he did a lot of dairy research and um, they wanted to be fair to the farmers because farmers that had a museum up here, we show, we have a little chart that shows the butterfat content of various animals. Buffalo is one, and they have quite rich butterfat milk. Um, goats as well is higher than cows. Uh, camels. Um, After about 1920, they started, you see that truck, that old-fashioned truck, 
cheese factory started going around and picking up milk for the farmers. So that meant that farmers had a better choice of which co-op they wanted to be in or if it was a factory they wanted to send their milk to. In Green Bay, Wisconsin, where they had the National Cheese Exchange, that went on for many decades until 1997 when they moved cheese trading to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And what would happen, they would have a 10 o'clock Friday morning auction and companies like Kraft and Sargento and a few others had excess cheese or they wanted to buy more cheese. At the cheese exchange, at the auction, this was before cell phones and before laptops and tablet computers, the buyers and sellers, they have a celebration called Cheese Days in Monroe. It would be the third week in September this year. It should have been two years ago, um, but we canceled it because of COVID. Since uh, 1914, we've had Cheese Days, and at first it was every year for a few years, and then it was every five or eight years. And that one in the middle, that's the kind that my relatives had. There were different brands. They had milking machines in Europe in the, as early as the late 1800s, but they really didn't catch on here until the 1940s. Now, there were some before that that ran by a gas generator, a noisy thing, that would create the vacuum. But until farms had electricity, they really, really didn't catch on. And then farms could have more cows. A lot of the farms also had pigs. They raised pigs and cows and chickens sometimes. This is the right one. We do, we do have others. We have one from 19, the 1930s cheese making, but this, this one shows making... After cutting, the cheese makers often cook the curd while training the way. When we're doing the cheddaring process, we're cutting the curd by... Stephen Babcock. The butterfat test, um, here it shows different kinds of animals. Reindeer have 17% butterfat in their milk. Holstein cow, 3.8%. And these are the little tubes that were used. And this is an old-fashioned thing. They, they'd add, they'd put the milk in there, a measured amount of milk, sulfuric acid, and then they would put it in a centrifuge. And this is really an old one. It's like a ride at the county fair. To spin it around, and they would do that for a measured amount of time. And then they would look at, they would look at the uh, amount in the graduated cylinder, and they could tell what the butterfat content was. And if it was more in a various in a certain farmer's milk, then they would get more in their milk check because the milk was more valuable. These are mostly Green County cheese factories. You said you have pictures of uh, your relatives. Oh, sure. And it would turn into like a thick, as you saw in the video, sort of thicker than yogurt, but not quite as thick as jello. They would use a cheese heart like this and go back and forth and cut it, and then they would mix it up and cut it some more, heat it up to about 120 degrees, and then they would judge when the cheese, when the curds were ready, and then usually they would have one guy on each side, but some of the old cheese factories, it would be, you know, one guy operation basically, maybe his wife would help him too. They used this as a counterweight, and the back of his shoes would be in that, so he could lean way over. Here's a picture on this um, newspaper. <coughs> they would lean way over. Sometimes someone would hold the cheesemaker's feet. Often the cheesemaker's wife would do that. We had a, a lady here, one of our, you know, heated with a fire. They used steam heat for these kind of, that redwood jacket around there would kind of create a space between the copper kettle and, as I mentioned, cheese grating started in 1921. Here you can show and see an example of what different grades of Swiss cheese look like. The cheese holes should be shiny and somewhat regular. That warehouse. Yeah, okay, that warehouse. It sounded sounded familiar. Mm -hmm. I just remember somebody worked there, and I know Carter yeah. Valley too. My sister yeah. lives yeah. in Greensburg. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Take it to the cellar after they get done making the cheese. Quarter to 
movie. They wipe it down with uh, vinegar, I think. You can flip it every day. Walk into the cellar. It smells good in here. It's a pretty interesting tour. If you're ever in Wisconsin. About 1,800 pound Swiss cow. How's it going? Almost done. This is fine right here. So, <laughs> in the process of making cheese, you have to hold the legs. <laughs> That's insane. A lot of times the wives used to do that. And sometimes if it was a fight, the wives had thoughts of letting them go. At least that's what I've heard. We got cheese grating. That'd be grade A, grade B, C. A D. Well, I can tell you why that's a D. Uh, higher the grade, the more money you get for your cheese. And I'm assuming the better it tastes. <laughs> See, women do cut the cheese. In the early days, it was considered a hobby. Which, I don't know, making cheese making, which still is a hobby today. Here's some cheese molds. From 1921, some Gouda, some baby Gouda. It's the brick mold. The cheesy wall. <laughs> hmm, some cheese salt. Mechanical stirring device. Cool. Filler. Huh. Well, here's an action. Cool. Milk cooler. Little cheese slicers. Thanks for joining me on today's cheesy video. I'll see you guys someplace or another. Have a great day. Bye. Stay tuned for more adventure to come. Subscribe, like, share, and thanks for watching. Bye.